So my name is Camille Ricketts. I actually am an MSJ graduate, um, so I'm really happy to be here. Mr. Richards was probably the most influential teacher I've ever had, and that includes everybody at Stanford, too. So I'm really, really happy to be here. <laughs> and you all that have him as a teacher are very lucky kids, so I hope you know that. Um, I'm here because I work at Kiva.org. Um, how many of you have heard of Kiva? Yeah? Oh, that's a good number of you. That's great. Um, how many of you know what microfinance is? Oh, awesome. This is going to be way easier than I thought. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about microfinance and what a powerful tool it is for not only fighting poverty, but just generally making the world a better place. Um, and really what I want to talk to you about today is not just the basics of microfinance and what small loans can do, but how it's actually changing and how Kiva is sort of leading the way um, to a new theory of microfinance and how it can be used for all kinds of different things and to reach all kinds of different people. Um, so that's the main thrust of my talk. Um, and so it's my job at Kiva, I'm the content manager, uh, is to tell stories. Uh, I'm going to start by telling you a few stories and I hope that you'll walk away with a better understanding of how microfinance can change the world and how you all can participate in it. Do I just... Maybe I'll just point at you. <laughs> so um, the story of microfinance starts in 1976 with this very jolly looking fellow. Um, does anyone know who this is? Yeah? Yes, Muhammad Yunus. And he's considered to be the father of modern microfinance. Um, but in 1976, he was just an economics student in Bangladesh. Uh, what really rose him to international prominence was an experiment that he conducted that year where he gave a $27 loan to be split between 42 different women in Bangladesh in a very rural village which was very impoverished. Uh, these were women that are living on less than a dollar a day, if you can imagine that. I can't imagine it personally. Um, so the fact that he lent just $27 to that size of a, of a group um, was actually really impactful. The women right away invested it in their businesses, whether it was planting more crops so they could increase their yield and make more money that way. Um, some of them bought livestock. Some of them bought more inventory for a store that they ran out of their homes to sell. Uh, across the board, the women who did take out the loans made more money and were able to sizably increase their livelihood going forward. And what was even more surprising and more impactful is that they paid the money back. Um, credit is not an original concept. It wasn't in 1976. Everybody had the experience of borrowing money. Um, but that was an experience that, was exclu that excluded a lot of people, including these women in Bangladesh. They didn't fit the profile of your regular borrower. They didn't have a credit history. They didn't have a track record of taking out money and then repaying it. They didn't have anything that could be used as collateral. Um, so nothing even that they could give to promise that they were going to pay the money back. But they valued the process so much and what that small investment could do for them that they did repay. Um, so the fact that that was demonstrated by Muhammad Yunus um, sort of became the foundation of modern microfinance and for that he won the Nobel Prize in 2006. So he's a very inspiring person and uh, one of the people that definitely drove the foundation of Kiva as well. So I'm going to tell you a few stories just to give you a sense of the scope of microfinance and what I've seen it make possible and what's happening all around the world today. I'm going to start with this gentleman. Uh, these people are all Kiva borrowers, by the way. His name's Prashant, and he lives two hours outside of the largest town in Odisha, India. And Odisha is the poorest province in a very poor country by and large. Um, so you can imagine what life is like two hours out of the largest city um, in that sort of region. Um, he lives with his wife and his daughter. He's 36 years old. And here he is smiling in his grocery store uh, that he now owns and runs. But life was not always like this for Prashant. In 2010, him and his son, who was 13 at the time, uh, got into an automobile accident. They were actually hit by a car as they were crossing a crowded street. And really tragically, uh, his son was killed almost immediately in the accident. And Prashant himself lost his left arm. Um, so huge personal tragedy, obviously. None of us in this room can possibly think about how you'd recover from the emotional impact of an event like that. But the more immediate concern for Prashant and his family were that he could no longer work as an electrician, which had been his profession prior to the accident. He had worked for the local government and made a pretty stable income, but now with his injury, he was unable to go back to that. Um, 
there was a concern that his family wasn't going to survive. Uh, it was that dire. He was the main breadwinner for his family. Um, and when something like that happens to somebody who doesn't have a safety net to fall back on, um, it's really unclear what will happen. Um, very luckily for Prashant, uh, his family came in touch with the local microfinance institution called People's Forum, um, who provided him with the small amount of credit that he needed to open up a grocery store out of his home. Uh, since then, he actually used a Kiva loan to buy a refrigerator, so now he can sell ice cream, which is a big deal in the village where he, are, he lives. Um, and he's making a pretty stable income now. Uh, so his, his family really was hanging in the balance, um, and a small loan made the difference. And now, uh, we actually had somebody go out and interview him to see how it was going, and he said his number one goal um, is to actually send his eight-year-old daughter to college. So the fact that that's um, the priority for somebody who was in this situation prior and that alone made even that goal possible is inspiring to me. So this is Renee, and it doesn't seem like Renee would be related to Prashant at all. She lives in the Philippines. Um, the one thing that she does have in connection with him is that she had parents like Prashant is to his daughter. He values education even though he didn't benefit from it himself. Um, Renee had parents similarly who worked hard in a rural environment and then did send her to school. So Renee was able to get the skills and the knowledge that she needed to found her own social enterprise. Uh, instead of just weaving, um, which is her skill um, and her specialty, she was able to create a business where she gave work to 50 other women around her village um, who are now weavers, and she helps them get their, their products exposure um, and provides a livelihood and a solid base for all of them to actually uh, get the proper nutrition, not have to choose between meals and school, and send their own kids to get the education uh, that Renee was able to get. So the fact that uh, she had parents that, like Prashant, valued that, um, really did elevate her, and then she used it to elevate her community. And the end of this story, um, sort of a connection between Prashant and Renee, are these kids, and they go to a school called African Leadership Academy uh, in Johannesburg, South Africa. And African Leadership Academy is an extremely special school and program. Um, it basically recruits the 100 brightest, brightest kids from the whole continent of Africa. A lot of these kids actually come from regions where there is no electricity, there's no running water, um, from really poor situations. 60% of them are actually come from low-income families who would not be able to afford this type of education without assistance. Um, they have had access to Kiva loans for a few months now uh, to buy laptops and equip themselves for all the things they need to succeed in this environment. Um, and they are only at African Leadership Academy because they were sponsored by their communities and had parents like Renee who were not only educated and realized the value of that for them, but were also willing to make the sacrifices to send them to a school like ALA. Um, so these kids, when they graduate, go to all kinds of schools, Yale, Princeton, Harvard, um, and then they go on. The sky's the limit, really, with what they could do. The really fascinating thing for me is that these kids are just two degrees separated from someone like Prashant. They're just two generations away. You go from basically barely surviving to having all of the opportunities that anybody in this room has. So that's really what microfinance has made possible, in my opinion, and what continues to inspire me to work at Kiva. So a little bit about Kiva um, and how it started. It started in 2005 by a married couple, Matt Flannery and Jessica Jackley. Um, they started in Uganda. They were really interested in how the internet could impact microfinance. They had seen it working in all these different ways. But then they really thought that if they could harness the power of the internet and get people to crowdfund loans by chipping in just $25 here, $25 there, with everybody else around the world, we could really support a lot of people with small loans. Um, in order to start the concept, things started pretty simply. Uh, we wanted to give loans to people who could repay very quickly um, on a weekly, monthly basis. So a lot of the loans were for stores to buy increased inventory so they could sell and make more money or to expand land, or the typical story that you hear about microfinance a lot is a loan to buy a cow, um, which then can produce milk and cheese to sell. You can even have the cow give birth to another cow, and your income has spiked from that one purchase. Uh, so those are the loans that we sort of started out with on Kiva. 
But now, eight years later, um, we're exploring a few other pathways, which I think are really interesting. So this is Stella. Um, she is sitting there with her solar lantern, studying after hours. She's in Uganda. And this is something that would have not been possible a really short time prior to now. Um, this is a light that's provided by a partner of Kiva's called Solar Sister. And the only way that Stella has this light is because her family got a loan to afford it. A solar lantern like this costs about between $15 and $25, which is a major purchase for some of the households that do receive them. Uh, it's like buying a car, for instance. So taking out a loan makes sense in that case. Um, but the fact that you can get a solar light now that allows you to study after dark, um, allows women to actually do more work after the day has ended, um, has really just expanded the number of hours that people can invest in themselves, um, go to school, do what they need to get done, um, has made a huge impact on just what it's like to live in these places. Another example, and there's been a lot of talk about smartphones today, so uh, Kiva is very interested in harnessing mobile technology in order to reach more people with information uh, and the funding and the access that they need to improve their lives. Um, this is an app that created by one of Kiva's partners called Grameen App Lab. Um, it's actually through the Grameen Foundation. And what it does is it provides agricultural information. It provides weather forecasts, uh, remedies to crop diseases. You can go on there and say, oh, my cow is sick with these symptoms. What is it? Um, it's information that basically allows farmers to be better at their jobs and more consistently make income and improve their lives. Uh, we're providing loans through Grameen App Lab for farmers to buy these phones and charging equipment so that they can make that knowledge available to all of their neighbors. And we've seen just tremendous response with this where people are going to these people called community knowledge workers to figure out how to better farm or just get some best practices. And it's making a huge difference for how much they can grow and how much they actually make in terms of income. This is a classroom setting. Uh, it could be anywhere. This is Strathmore University in Nairobi. It's one of the most prestigious universities in, uh, the con on the continent of Africa. We partner with Strathmore to provide student loans. And student loans are not really that commonplace of a thing. I know all of us in this room probably could anticipate getting some student loans uh, in order to finance our higher education. It was just, it's just something that comes part and parcel with succeeding today um, or being a kid who goes to college. That is not the case for most people around the world. Definitely not in most places, even if you have all the qualifications and you're really bright and really motivated, you still might not get to go to college just because simply you can't afford it. Um, and that's becoming an even more dire situation now as we see more and more kids actually qualified and interested in going to college across the board, which is an amazing thing. Like that in itself is just an incredible testament to our progress as humanity. But if we can't meet that demand, um, it's going to be a major failure. But if we can meet it, it could be an enormous opportunity. So the fact that we're providing student loans now on Kiva um, that might take a little bit more longer to get repaid, they might be a little bit of larger loans, are providing opportunity to people who haven't had it before. And it's incredible to see what they might do with it. And this is a last example, um, which I thought might be relevant because we are on a school campus. Uh, but this is our partner called Sanergy. And what Sanergy does is kind of unsexy, but they provide toilets in places where there are very few toilets. So if you think about slums in many places of the developing world, there's simply a lack of proper sanitation. And one of the more critical situations, and with this is the case, is on school campuses, where there's no toilet facilities actually causing kids to not go to school, um, especially girls. Some people actually drop out because there's just simply nowhere to go to the bathroom in a lot of places, which is mind-boggling to me. Um, but we started working with this company, Sanergy, that sells uh, very sanitary portable toilets. And one of our key borrowers through Sanergy um, used her Kiva loan to purchase two toilets for her primary school campus. And now enrollment is actually boosted simply because of that. You have more kids staying in primary school and starting their educations because of a super simple solution like this that alone can make possible. So while it's a little bit less sexy than the mobile phones and all of that, I think it's incredibly important and something that we really need to think about in terms of development, where there's, there are these very, very simple fixes that make a huge impact. 
So just to wrap up, um, I just I wanted to highlight a few more areas where Kiva's working that's a little bit unique. For example, we're providing loans for former gang members in Latin America so that they can start businesses rather than drifting back to violence. Uh, we provide loans for communities to buy chlorine dispensers to put next to their water access points so they can disinfect their water without having to worry about diarrheal disease, all of that. Um, and we're providing loans for women in Iraq so that they can start their own businesses and not only help make gender equality there more the norm, but to stabilize a conflict zone. Uh, so loans can really be deployed for so many different things. And I'm really excited to be a part of Kiva because it allows anybody with an internet connection to participate in any of these solutions. Um, so I'm really excited to expose you guys to this. And I hope that um, maybe you'll ask me some questions about it, but I'd be happy to tell you more. Um, if you are interested in learning more, I would recommend going to kiva.org. And you can sign up and actually make a $25 loan to anybody of your choice on the site um, right there. And um, I think the cool thing it sort of changes your relationship to charity. Because most people think, oh, I want to do something good. I'm going to go make a donation. But you never really see where that donation goes. You can just sort of feel the glow of having done something good. Um, on Kiva, you see who that loan has helped. And you actually get your money back most of the time. We have a 99.9% .9 repayment rate. Um, so you can actually help people again and again and again, which is sort of a rare opportunity in the charity world. Um, and the last thing I'll add is that we're very, very interested in getting people in your age demographic more engaged with microfinance. We think that it's one of the most powerful tools that we can possibly har harness to address poverty. Um, so we're actually going to launch an initiative for um, high school and college kids who are interested in getting involved with microfinance. Um, so stay tuned for that. And we'll be hosting a summit, um, I think, on the Stanford University campus this October. Uh, for anybody who's interested in uh, meeting the Kiva staff and just uh, being thought partners with us in terms of how we can reach more people um, and get even more people your age engaged. Uh, so I, I want to keep it short, and I'd love to answer any questions if you have them. Yeah. This room? Um, <laughs> I mean, I would say yes. Uh, having, having been in a lot of different types of classrooms, uh, I've seen a lot of technology being deployed really interestingly. So while I think MSJ might be sort of constrained by some budget issues or whatever, what have you, um, there are opportunities, I think, to like make an environment like this a little bit more savvy, probably. I don't know if that's a good <laughs> answer. Yeah. How did I find Kiva? Yeah, sort of an interesting story. I was a journalist for a long time, and sort of storytelling has always been my thing. Um, and as a writer, I did PR. I tried out with that in the corporate world. It really wasn't my thing either. I wanted to do a nonprofit. I really wanted to see what working at a nonprofit was like. Um, and Kiva is really one of the most prominent ones that you'll see out there. There's Charity Water, there's UNICEF, and Kiva's really up there. And I was just so interested in this model where you can actually make an investment and then get the money back to do it again. Um, that I, when this job came up and the opening was basically to collect all of these amazing stories and relate them to an audience, I just couldn't pass it up. So, um, and I had a good friend who worked there from college who also was very blissfully happy and uh, I have been since I've worked there as well. Yeah, I wouldn't say the charity's wasted. I think that there are um, definitely avenues that are really important. Like I mentioned Charity Water. They're building wells, and they really are making an effort to be more transparent. And that's a trend that's sort of across the board with most charities today, where they are making an effort to show you where your money is going and how it's being used. And technology is just making that easier. Um, so I think that that's definitely, there's definitely worthy causes out there, and I'm not saying that Kiva or microfinance are the only ones. The one thing that I would say is interesting is when you invest in an idea that's making the world a better place um, to help it become sustainable, that becomes a really compelling concept because you're not just throwing money at the problem or the issue. Um, you're giving the people on the ground 
the tools they need to sustainably address the issue. Um, so in that way, I think that microfinance is a very strong um, approach to those sorts of things. Thank you, Camille. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> one more round of applause for all our speakers this session.